Brew Strong is brought to you by Blickman Engineering, home of the top tier brewing stand. Visit them online at BlickmanEngineering.com. for the beer radio you've been looking for. This is the show that dispels myths, tackles the toughest topics, and makes no apologies for geeking out on beer. Hosted by two guys that drink before they think. Jamil Zainashev and John Palmer. This is Brew Strong. Hey, howdy, hey, my brewing brothers and sisters. Greetings, cretins. <laughs> uh, getting all My Christmassy up in here, here, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, up here in Grinchland, up on the mountain. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> you going down to Hoosville and stealing all their presents? Yep, getting ready. Got the, got the dog, hitched the sleigh now for several days. Mm-hmm. He's waiting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I would think as it got colder up around here, that some of these fruit flies might uh, die off, Taylor. <laughs> it's not cold in the studio, though. Right. That's the well, thing. You know, uh, so I was thinking maybe maybe they're coming from outside. Apparently not. Nope. And these are interesting fruit flies because they, they, they are living much longer. than a fr- How long is a fruit fly supposed to live? Like three days? A couple of days? Yeah. Right? No, no, yeah, no longer than a week. Right. Definitely. Well. Now, some of these, we've been naming them. And I mean, we could tell by the marks on like their wings and on their tails, and they're getting a little big. They're, uh, no, the sun, red eyes. they are the bumblebee <laughs> of of uh, fruit flies, and well, you, they're probably you, Silicon Valley fruit flies. You can yeah. start to, you start recognizing these guys. You know, they wave to you. you know, we know them by name. They are mm-hmm. they are here. Oh, I yeah. think and we need a fruit multiple fruit fly guts on my window in here because yes. I just keep smashing. They're, they're them. ancestors. We need ancestors past. They've learned. I really yes. should wash that. We need a, a good a good freeze in here. You guys ought to like open up the doors, turn off the heat, and let it kill all these things. Just in overnight, here. just let them freeze to death. They'll freeze to death at the sixty two degrees it is in Concord. <laughs> <laughs> Sweater oh, weather. I bet you! I bet you! Our good friend John Blickman's wearing a sweater. He's I in, bet he uh, is. Mm-hmm. you know, Indianapolis. Where is he? Yeah, yeah, Indianapolis. It's, uh, there. They're, they're there. experiencing that. Uh, what is it that Arctic? Um, Arctic chill. The Arctic vortex. The polar vortex. There we go. The polar vortex. The freeze of death. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it hasn't dampened his uh, his giving spirit. You That's know, true. Besides making, uh, you know, the great innovative uh, brewing equipment he does, uh, for the first time ever, the uh, generous John Blickman and Blickman Engineering is giving away a grand prize of a brew easy system this holiday season with the winner announced uh, the week before Christmas. So get on it right away if you're listening. Other prizes will be drawn, including a quick carb, a cornicle. Oh. Uh, it says here a cornicle. Are they giving away a cornicle? Yep, that's the uh, conical fermenter that it, um, it ferments it's corn. A, Maybe well, it it's, like a, a corn cob. it's a keg that you can ferment in. Ah, uh, it is a corny fermenter. Yes, a cornicle. A corny conical. A cor- mm-hmm. Yeah, because it sounds like it's made to look like a corn cob. Uh, a hellfire burner and that's a, uh, a brew vision thermometer. Uh, yes. So sign up today by clicking on the banner on their webpage, uh, www.blickmanengineering.com. Like, uh, go in there today. Uh, you know, lots of goodies. Sign up quick before it is too late. And uh, make sure you're good, for goodness sake. <laughs> do, you, do you think that would help? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because, you know, you can it? see, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And and how have you been doing? Have you been doing good as of late? Yeah, actually, um, I, I've been cutting down on my cursing lately. So, yeah, you know, I think that would be a, a big help. Goddamn why? <laughs> well, you know, the, the, book's, the book is almost finished. So I just don't have any need to curse anymore. 
I would think you'd be cutting down on your drinking. Um, I know you write the book. No, all actually, I can e- I can increase that now. I'm yeah. I'm terrible. If I've had two drinks, I can't write anything. Oh, it takes me two drinks to start writing something. Uh, <laughs> no, I just I get See, you and I should do a book together point. because. You could start. I can start drinking, and then you know we could drink together. And then once you're two two in, I, I can take over. Yeah, I was just talking to the, the, the um, uh, was it um, Tampa uh, home brewers this past weekend, and they want us to revise brewing classic styles. And I said, well, you realize that all of these recipes that Jamil <laughs> put in the book, you know, are are winning recipes. We'd have to enter competitions all over again. But they said no, that wasn't necessary. Anything that we dreamed up would be would be fine. Uh-huh. Wouldn't have to be. They would take it on faith. And people have been asking that. However, yeah. I have told them, well, you need to convince the publisher that you want it, and that oh, it would yes. sell. And there, the publisher is like, eh. I'm like, all right. <laughs> the two biggest names in brewing, though, I'm, I'm surprised. But well, my I, name I is kind of so. long. But uh, yeah. I don't think yours is, is one of the biggest names in, in brewing because there's got to be, like, longer ones. Yeah. I got, like, yeah. you know, 15 letters in my last name. Mm-hmm. That's a big Yeah, I only got six, so. Yeah. Story of my life. <laughs> uh, you know, the other thing that's going on, uh, you know, uh, the only thing worse than giving out bad beer for the holidays is having those bottles be... As naked as drunk Uncle Frank gets after too much eggnog. With Grog Dag, <laughs> you never again have to worry about bottled nudity at the table because they have you covered. Fully customizable, reusable labels ready to peel and stick on just about any surface. And they don't stop there. Grog Dag also offers an assortment of products you can customize for your home bar. With custom coasters, metal signs, and tap handles, Grog Tag will make sure your entire family wants you to wants to try your beer this year. The easiest wrapping you'll have to do this holiday season is with a set of grog tags. Use code DEC16, December 16, and take 10% off your next order at grogtag.com. Woohoo! Grog tag. All right, let's take a short break. When we come back, we're going to uh, be talking with uh, Malcolm Frazier about uh, some decoction experiments and uh, proof once and for all. That decoction does or doesn't. Are you looking for a simple brewing system that's great for all grain brewing, but everything on the market seems to be full of compromises? Blickman Engineering has the answer. The Blickman Brew Easy All Grain Brewing System. The Brew Easy is a complete system with easy upgrades and a beautiful compact design, perfect for any size brewing location. At its core, the Brew Easy is built on two gorgeous Blickman Boilermaker brew kettles, a high temperature March pump, and either a top tier gas burner or the new boil coil electric heater. The Brew Easy adapter lid allows the pots to stack on top of each other, forming an efficient, strong, and compact brewing setup that comes in 5, 10, and 20-gallon batch sizes. Upgrade your brew easy system with full automated control by adding a Blickman Tower of Power temp controller and make moving around easy with the Blickman Kettle Cart. The brew easy is modular. If you already own a Boilermaker kettle, you can build your brew easy by purchasing just the modules you need. The new brew easy all-grain brewing system. See it today at BlickmanEngineering.com and brew with Blickman quality on your new brew easy since the first time the brewing network microphones turned on more beer was behind it more beer sponsors the programming on the bn because like you they love brewing and like the brewing network they love sharing their knowledge morebeer.com isn't just a website to place your next equipment or ingredient order morebeer.com also gives you access to free beer information that will make you a better brewer go to morebeer.com and click into the learning center you'll find podcasts technical facts video tutorials and more including access to the buzz more beer social network of more than 5,000 members and some of them might even be crazier about beer than you are get over to morebeer.com today and take advantage of the buzz, the forum, the learning center, and make sure you're signed up to receive the newest More Beer catalog. More Beer, bringing you absolutely everything for beer making. When I order a beer, I want my server to know more about it than I do. I want someone who enjoys good beer and loves helping others enjoy it too. I want someone who knows how to pour a perfect pint for every beer style. I want a Cicerone. 
The Cicerone Certification Program is creating the type of people who help you enjoy great beer. Home brewers and craft beer lovers know beer is more flavorful and complex than ever, and it takes some serious knowledge to store and serve beer right. Cicerone's No Beer. There are three levels in the Cicerone Program. Certified Beer Server, Certified Cicerone, and Master Cicerone. Cicerones are truly the sommeliers of beer. The best beer locations have a certified Cicerone on staff. Relaxed and unpretentious. Cicerones are tested on storing and serving beer, beer styles, flavor and tasting, the brewing process and ingredients, and pairing food with beer. Learn more about your next beer guide at Cicerone.org. Certified Cicerone, because it takes top talent to present a perfect pint. Back to the beer guys that make other beer guys look like wine guys. Brew strong. All right, we're back. I wanted to tell everybody, I mean, it's the the month of giving, yes? Uh, it is. The folks at Craft Brew are giving away uh, Catalyst Fermenter. Oh, wow. Those are nice. On this show. Go figure. On this show. <laughs> That's what I said. Um, it could be this show, or we could push it to uh, the, the next show, which is the live Q&A. Oh, okay. I mean, we do either one. I'm thinking. We'll see. At the at the end of the show, we'll we'll see what we got going on, and maybe we will give it away at the end of this show. This could uh, be a very popular listeners. show. So. I'm, that's what I'm thinking. Well, it's live listeners. I mean, because we, we're giving this thing away tonight. All right. One way or another, we're picking a winner tonight. So, I don't know if you all seen the Craft Brew uh, Catalyst, but it is a... Uh, a conical fermenter made from plastic that's over 90% more scratch resistant than other plastic conicals. 71% less oxygen permeable. It is low profile. It's got this stand that allows you to put it on your countertop, put it in your fridge, wherever. It's nice and compact. Cleaning's a breeze because the whole lid comes off the top and you can reach all in there and, and scrub away to your heart's content. And the best part of it is this giant three-inch butterfly valve on the bottom. So you can uh, attach a mason jar on that thing, dump that yeast out, and uh, uh, be ready to go for your next uh, pitch of yeast. You can toss that in the fridge and be ready for your next batch of beer. And um, they also recently teamed up with Stone Brewing Company to offer a homebrew version of the famous Stone Pale Ale. And uh, they got it in their, their products version section of their website. You know, learn more at craftbrew.com and stay tuned for the giveaway of the uh, catalyst on this show. It's, it's a, that's, a nice, that's a nice giveaway, huh? It is indeed. I am very. Maybe I'll win it. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. That's, that's a possibility, I'm sure. Uh huh. Uh huh. I hope I don't know this thing. Darn it. Right, right. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, all right, we uh, are welcoming uh, Malcolm Frazier. Hey, Malcolm, you there? Yeah. How are you guys doing? All right. I I um, just have to ask, any relation to uh, Kelsey Grammer? Oh, absolutely. Uh, he's my uh, nothing, nothing at all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do like this thing about scrambled eggs, so how's mm-hmm. that? Toss, tossing salads? Yeah. <laughs> There's a Navy joke in there somewhere. I was in the Navy, so it's it's, it's good. Yep. Yeah, I was wondering if anyone would, would understand what the hell I was saying. Oh, I, lo- I like obscure humor, so I think we're yeah. good. Okay, good. Well, then you've, and, and you've, Jamil's a big fan of the Navy. You've tuned in. I bet he is. <laughs> the dance especially. You've tuned, in, you've tuned into the right place. Um. <laughs> All right, so Malcolm, you uh, are are the experimenting kind. That's the rumor. And I mean uh, a bunch of, I mean about four others or three others at uh, Brewlosophy, absolutely. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, you uh, you you took on the uh, decoction, the uh, the myth or the reality of decoction. Yeah, uh, it was something that's been asked a lot, and. There wasn't a lot of hands raised on who wanted to do it. Mm-hmm. It's actually a process that I do not mind. I find it cathartic and relaxing. So, absolutely, I said I'd do it. Did you did, do a lot of decoction before doing this, or? I think that's kind of a personal question, Jay Z. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I've done it 
for a variety of reasons. One, to just try it, right? And mm -hmm. uh, basically, the first time I tried it was because I missed the mash temperature. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, guess what I'm doing? And uh, I've also done it for the the throwback to the history and the, and the style uh, of uh, some German and Czech brewing. So I just did it for the sake of, uh, hey, let's try this. And, you know, I, a lot of people bitch about the, the, the long, arduous process of decocting and sloshing, you know, grain and, and, and wort back and forth. And I just never really minded it. I didn't think it was that bad of a, a big of a deal. Well, so. if the beer turns out, you know, just absolutely fantastic and um – you know, it's the only way to get it, then, of course, uh, it's worth every bit, right? Right. And, you know, I'm, I'm in between those two schools. So I'm a pragmatist, and I like to do the least amount possible to make great beer. Mm -hmm. But at, at times, I'll throw that all away and just do it for the process and for the nostalgia and mm -hmm. the connection to the history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, homebrewing, it was like a vacation. And so if there was something that made the vacation longer, it didn't really bother me. <laughs> And the right, only reason right. I wanted to trim stuff out was either to, you know, control my process better or really to have more time to brew more batches. Well, one of the things I've found is that, you know, people want to come, you know, hang out with, with brewers, you know. So you have a couple of guys at the brew club and they're like, hey, I want to, you know, want to come by and brew with you. I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. And so they show up. We'll say, hey, guess what? I'm mashing in at, you know, 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. They show up. And as, as soon as I know I have a volunteer, I'm like, ha, ha, we're decocting today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I have a volunteer stir. So, yeah, you know, that extends the process and makes the brew day longer. But it's time to BS and just enjoy this, the smell of the malts wafting from the kettle. It's a great mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. Uh, hmm. All right. So tell us about uh, your experiment. Tell okay, us about, you know, the – well, tell us uh, what what were the parameters of your experiment. How did you control it? Tell, you don't need to tell us the results yet, but tell us uh, the setup and, and all that. Okay. So a decoction in general has been requested. Now, that can be taken a lot of different ways, right? So with all of our experiments, what we'll do is we'll – We'll like brainstorm, you know, the, the the four of us, and we'll get together and say, well, how shall we do this? Because there's so many variables that can come into it, and you have to control as much as you can. But at the same time, there's certain things you just you just can't control, right? Well, with decoction, uh, for those who are familiar with it, and I think uh, John will probably go in more detail about it later, but. Essentially, for a large portion of the mash, you're boiling. So what happens when you boil? You drive off water and you concentrate the wort. Well, I didn't want the only aspect of decoction that we tested to be, does a beer with a more concentrated wort make for a different beer? Because mm -hmm. I think even even though you know we don't have to make assumptions, but that right. seemed apparent to me. Yes, mm -hmm. if you boil for an extra 30, 40 minutes – the beer will probably be different. That doesn't right. mean that's the case. Doesn't well, mean that's the case. But. Even that, I was talking to somebody about that they wanted, you know, to do a ninety-minute boil because they believed it, you know, increased the maltiness of the beer. And I'm like, it doesn't really. It if you just take that same amount of liquid at the end, just add the water back to the same volume as a sixty-minute boil, it, it pretty much same color, tastes the same. I mean, it right. and, develops and, very and, little color. And that was one of the controls for this experiment, you know. And we we discussed not doing that. We discussed doing a straight decoction versus a straight infusion, you know. But then the result would have been, hey, you boiled for another thirty minutes, and does a ten fifty three beer taste different than a you know one point zero five zero beer? Mm -hmm. and even then, I wouldn't be a surprise if the answer was no. But right. to me, it would have been like uh, you know tilting your hand, mm -hmm. you know, you mm -hmm. know, uh, you know, overweighing the the. the the odds. Mm -hmm. So what I did is after the decoction, and I used a batch barge because, especially for experiments, it's more easy to control for the variables. So after I sparged, I looked at the volume of the two uh, side by side brewed uh, batches, mm -hmm. and I realized I was about you know a little over a liter different because of all the evaporation. So what I did was I diluted. With the same strike water, same makeup and everything, mm -hmm. I diluted the decoction beer back to the same volume as the infusion beer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And guess what? The color was pretty much exactly the same. Right. Yep. 
Uh, all right. So what was your what was your recipe and what was your you know the decoction? So everyone can tell you how you did it wrong. Right, and that's that's I'm glad you brought that up. And we can talk about that later if you want. But uh, you always do an experiment wrong. <laughs> and and that that more or less comes down to which side the results are on and which side you believe. So so for this recipe, it's like elections. Yeah, exactly. It's so uh, for this recipe, I I opted to do a German pilsner, and of course that was the wrong beer. I should have done insert beer style here. Uh, so I did a German pilsner, and it's a very simple German German pilsner with ninety two percent, you know, more or less. Weirman two row, and then about five percent Carahel, and about three percent, you know, make up the difference acid malt, and that was primarily done to limit how much liquid acid I had to put in. Mm-hmm. So uh, the bittering hops was what I had on hand, which was uh, U.S. Zots, and that was like six point five percent. Now I'm not going to go into uh, amounts. But that was for the bulk of the bittering, more or less. So uh, the beer was targeted like in the mid-40s, which is high, but that's what I wanted. it. And then the rest of the hops were Hollertauer, Erzbrucker, Erzbrucker. And uh, I added some at 30 and some at 5 minutes for a little bit of that you know, noble aroma. Mm-hmm. And I only got a, a few IBUs out of those additions. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeast, I used German Bach. White Labs 833. Uh, I was able to borrow it from a local brewery called Helicon. They they focus on a lot of German lagers, so he had a big, fresh, massive slurry to give me. So it made that easier, you know, instead of having to build up a, a starter and split it out and everything mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Water profile. Uh, I have pretty moderately hard water here, so I adjusted the water. The final water profile was uh, calcium. These are all PPM. Uh, calcium 70, um, magnesium 16, sodium 36, sulfite about 110, chloride 67, and I, I targeted a mash pH of about uh, 5.3. And this is all on brewlosophy.com if you want to go check out the exact recipe. Mm-hmm. Okay. So a lot of people, you know, they were like, well, you should do a Bach. Well, you should do a Czech Pills. You should mm-hmm. do uh, something that didn't have so much bitterness to get in the way of the malt. <laughs> yeah. And and you know, I think, I think all those arguments have merit, you know, to some degree. <laughs> uh, you can argue kind of either you. way, right? I uh-huh. mean, come on. Does a very intense malty Bach cover up the flavor of uh, of a subtle enhancement by decoction? Mm-hmm. Does uh, does a check pills, which is very close to a, it's very close to a, a bitter. Mm-hmm. I mean, not, not a bitter. I. Uh, a bitter pale, which is a, a German pills, mm-hmm. and I think you guys have talked about on your show. You know, the major difference might be slightly more bitterness and a bit of a water difference, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Between a Czech pills and a, and a, yeah. a German pills. So, so um, I did a Bach first, but I had a, a horrible uh, Dexter scene in which I, I opened up my chest freezer and there was beer Dead everywhere. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I. I you know, after I was screaming out loud and, and, and realized that I oxidized an entire keg and wasted an entire bottle of uh, CO2, mm-hmm. I had to rebrew it, and I was I was still under the uh, under the uh, influence of the loss of the Bach. I was like, screw it, I want to drink a German Pils. So mm-hmm. that's what I brewed for this experiment. Mm-hmm. Okay, it makes sense to now, me. How did you decide um, what decoction schedule you're going to use? Oh, that's that's a good topic. So essentially. I didn't want to do an overly aggressive decoction because, one, I wanted to skip the acid rest because, okay, you can go both ways here too. But essentially, if you do the acid rest, the idea of that is to take advantage of the what, the phytic acid rest, right? right? And that lowers the pH. And that was done on purpose by uh, traditional German brewers. But since I was doing acid adjustments and mineral adjustments to do both of these beers – that would have been yet another variable. So I decided, hey, I'm going to take the acid rest out of it. I don't think it's needed. And uh, I decided to skip that that portion of it. And I didn't want to do an extensive protein rest because one of the reasons originally, at least traditionally, for doing a decoction was to – 
compensate for these slightly undermodified or very undermodified uh, malts. So that's not the case now. And depending on which source you believe, but I tend to believe this part of it, modern malts are – are modified enough such that doing a protein rest can actually actually be detrimental to uh, foam. So doing extensive protein rest to me was not the way I wanted to go, mm-hmm. not with modified malts. You know, I used a standard Vireman uh, grist. You know, I wasn't going to be using chip malt, etc. So I I dowed in at the uh, the first rest was a protein rest at 133, and I only hit it for a little bit, only for the sake of let's see if. Uh, I wanted to work in a triple decoction, right, because I wanted to give enough time for boil. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I don't don't want to do like a 90-minute rest, and I don't need that, you know, so I'll break the rest up into three steps. That gave me multiple steps, so I just chose 133. So the the decoction schedule I I borrowed from uh, Kai Troister's uh, Mm browkaiser.com, and there's a, a type of decoction called a Huckers, which means uh, hot and short, or high and sh- high and short. Now, traditionally, a uh, high and short or huckers. I'm it's probably like Dr. Scott. That. So, go ahead. That's like Dr. Scott. Yeah, traditionally <laughs> that's a <laughs> traditionally that's a double decoction, but I worked in a mash out into that, and and the reason for that was to give more boiling. So, I did 133. That was my dough in. I did 148 for a beta amylase rest. I, you know, pulled a decoction. I did a 158, I believe. Uh, once again, brewlosophy.com has the exact schedule, and that was my uh, more or less targeting an alpha amylase rest. And then I did a mash out. At, uh, my target was 170, but I think I ended up around 171, 172. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's the problem right there. That's why yeah, you didn't get the result. See, yeah. yeah, I figured you'd you'd, you'd find that. <laughs> Okay. And so then you um, you compared this to a single infusion. Um, what, uh, what your your uh, infusion temperature or target rest was? What there? That was one forty eight Fahrenheit, and the reason for that was uh, with all these rests, I assumed that the the wort would be very fermentable. So mm-hmm. I I went in at one forty eight, hoping to get. A, a fairly fermentable wort and equally uh, fermentable single infusion okay. right and some of you have heard the stories of you know today's malt being very hot you know very you know, so basically you hit, you hit it with strike water and boom it's it, it's converted and, and my experience hasn't been much less than that uh, there are a few exceptions but more or less most most malts i find convert in 20 30 minutes and uh Despite the the decoction, you know, beer going through multiple steps, the in single infusion beer they they ended up within within a gravity point of each other, maybe a half gravity point of each other, final gravity. Oh, that's that's uh, uh, pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Um, well. Let's uh, let's take a short break, and uh, when we come back, we'll, well talk more about Well, John, the... hold on just a second. Uh-oh. Uh, all right. You thought of something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. You know, the, the, the White Labs Bakis that you talked about, you can get that from whitelabs.com. But you know what you can get from them? They've got the vault. The vault is open. If you go to whitelabs.com slash the vault. You can see a range of different yeasts. You know, White Lab has been around over 20 years, and they've been uh, collecting up all these different uh, uh, yeasts over the years, and many of them you never get a chance to access. Well, the vault is allowing you access into that. They they uh, sort through their, their massive uh, collection of yeasts and things that you normally can't get, and they test them out, and they say, oh, this one really tastes good. Well, let's put that in the, in the offering. And you go to this, this vault, 
and you can essentially uh, pre-order one of these yeasts. If they get enough pre-orders, they'll go ahead and crank out a batch of that yeast, and you'll get to try something that you otherwise would have absolutely no access to. It's just you and the people in the uh, in the vault that are that are getting this yeast. If that doesn't come to pass, well, then you know you can vote on something else, or uh, you know uh, you know try again. I would suggest getting your homebrew club together and, and selecting one of these. Uh, Really interesting yeast that they, they put in the vault. Anyway, so you can check it out, uh, whitelabs.com slash uh, the vault, and, uh, and uh, you know, check out all their, their goodies there, whitelabs.com. All right. Um, you know, one of the things that I want to uh, cover, because, again, you know, people become very passionate about their decoction, and they believe that decoction works. And gotcha. so... Um, uh, here you go. Uh, one one guy says, uh, Ulrich uh, says, uh, there are historic reasons for de- decoction, mashing, decoction mashing in Bavaria. Listen to many brewing shows, and the reasons for decoction mashing are usually explained because of poor quality under-modified grains, supposedly only available at time in Germany. Meantime, he found a brewing manual from 1854 in the head brewer at Spaten in Munich. Uh, he said uh, he went into extreme detail uh, about uh, uh, mashing, boiling, fermenting, lagering in extreme detail. Also, many recipes like your book, Jamel. Uh, the brewer at the time, uh, they were very well, affair, uh, well, very well aware of the infusion mashing practice in England and elsewhere. Uh, describes infusion mashing in great detail. However, decoction mashing was used because the resulting beers were thought to be better tasting and thought to have better stability in shelf life than beers produced with infusion mashing method. Uh, he said this is important at the time in Bavaria because a, at the time a lot of lagers were produced that needed to rest a long time, where in England mostly ales were produced that uh, were consumed much more rapidly. So the decoction mashing procedures uh, were producing a wort that has different fermentation qualities. The time fermentation was divided in five stages, first fermentation, second stage, foam, third yeast, fourth stage, and then barrel uh, barrel aging, uh, barrel fermentation. Brewer describes the decoction mashing dissolves some of the the binders. He calls it rubber from the grain <laughs> into the wort, and that they are then available to the yeast during the barrel fermentation stage. Therefore, the barrel fermentation stage would be stronger with a decoction mash that with a uh, with a beer that was produced with a single infusion mashing procedure uh, blah, blah, blah. apparently this fifth fermentation stage is very important in order to lager the beers and so that they would not spoil during this process uh 1854 wow. that's, a, that's a real nice story um, i mean could it be brett that's uh, consuming the rubbers in the uh, in the work <laughs> back in 1854 so could be, but yeah, and and again, I would say you found uh, no real difference in fermentation. Um, is that correct? That's right. Uh, within, uh, and I use a precision hydrometer for final gravity, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, depending on how you read it, I would say what's within a half degree gravity points. So what's that? Point uh, two five Plato. Right. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. and, uh, even less. Yeah, less than that. One eighth, even. One eighth. Let's let's go to John Palmer for math. Right, one eighth. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, which one? Which one like... finished uh, lower? Huh? Huh? A uh, massive difference. The, the, I can go look yeah. at my pictures real quick, and the decoction did finish slightly lower. Oh, there you go. That's the whole reason why the uh, half a half a. Uh, a point uh, specific gravity is uh, really that's clearly in favor of decoction (laughs) well on that bombshell let's uh, take a short break and when we come back we'll have more with Malcolm after this 
If you work in retail sales, the restaurant industry, or are a new craft beer enthusiast, or you know someone who is, you have got to check out Beer 101. Beer 101 is an online course created for anyone wanting a quick introduction to the vast world of craft beer. Beer 101 covers the history of beer, brewing ingredients and processes, vital stats like ABV, SRM, IBU and gravity, styles, tasting, glassware, and pairing beer with food. The Beer 101 course is offered by the Brewers Association at craftbeer.com, also home to the truly awesome Beer Style Finder, a visual guide to every beer style. Quickly play with color, bitterness, and alcohol content to interactively explore the entire world of beer styles with a gorgeously designed interface to your favorite beverage. The new Beer 101 course and new Beer Style Finder are only available at craftbeer.com. Craftbeer.com, celebrating the best of American beer. BN Army, have you heard the latest at Hop Tech? Since Hop Tech has doubled in size after a huge expansion, Jade and Roberto can stock even more of the best quality homebrewing supplies and equipment. Over 60 kick ass varieties of hops and malts, monster truckloads of quality brewer's yeast, including white labs, Y yeast, and multiple dry yeasts. They even have all grain systems from Grain Fathers and Ruby Street Brew Systems, thanks to Jade, the brand new all grain brewer. And don't forget about their 10% discount to all BN Army members. Jade and Roberto are waiting for you and all of your brewing questions over at hoptech.com. Hoptech, totally not sucking since 1983. Hey, my brewing brothers and sisters, this is Jamel Zanishev, and I want to tell you about Heretic Evil Twin. You might be familiar with my homebrew recipe, which uses massive late hopping to create a balance between the malty sweet and the hoppy bitter, along with an outrageous malt and hop character. I wanted a beer with the same bold hop and malt character, so we played around with the homebrew recipe until we were able to make a great commercial version, too. We've created a beer rich in malt character, full of caramel, toast, biscuit, and an ever-so-subtle roast note. On top of that, we piled in an insane amount of citra and Columbus hops at the end of the boil, as well as in dry hopping. This damn-the-cost approach to hopping gives Heretic's Evil Twin a great blast of citrus and tropical fruit that can't be matched by any other hop. The result is a bold, malty, hoppy, but easy-drinking beer. This is our top seller, our flagship beer, and I couldn't be prouder of it. Cheers. To find Heretic Beers near you, click on Find Some at hereticbrewing.com. First Amendment. Watch out! Do you like beer? They make beer. Watch out! Do you like friends and fun? They make friends and fun. Watch out! Do you still like to have a good time? The 21st Amendment. Watch out! The 21st Amendment in San Francisco, located at 563 2nd Street, two blocks from the building where baseball is seen and played. Try their beers in the pub or try them in the can. Featuring... Monk's Blood. Made with real monk. Watch out! So why not have the best time of your life? Go to the 21A and Sean O'Sullivan will personally greet you with a can of... Monk's Blood. The 21st Amendment. Watch out! This advertisement is not in any way affiliated nor associated with the 21st Amendment Bar and Pub, nor its subsidiaries or affiliates. This telecast is not copywritten by the 21st Amendment for the private use of the Brewing Network. Any use of this telecast without Jamil Zanishev's consent is prohibited. Suck it, JP. The Vault, created by White Labs. The Vault is a collection of new, creative, and unique yeast strains from around the world. These strains have never been available to homebrewers. Most have not even been available to professionals. You have the power to release the yeast. Through The Vault, White Labs is giving you the power to decide which strains are put into production and giving you the opportunity to brew with these strains. Visit whitelabs.com slash the vault and pre-order the yeast strain of your choice and encourage your friends to do the same. Once 250 pre-orders have been achieved, White Labs will put that strain into production. The strain will be mailed directly to your doorstep, ready to make the beer you've always wanted to brew. This program was created with the home brewer in mind. White Labs is relying on you to help release these strains, which may blaze the way for future new and unique beers. Help release the yeast. Visit whitelabs.com slash the vault. Back. 
back to the two guys that know how to turn beer into beer. This is Brew Strong. Hey, Malcolm, have you used the uh, AHA's uh, Brew Guru app? I think you're on mute still, huh? <laughs> I'll take that as a no. Can you hear me now? Silence means that, yeah. We can hear Oh, that's that's an enthusiastic endorsement of the Brew Guru app. It's actually really cool. I don't know if you've tried it, but um, I I love it. It's it's fast, it's free, and it tells me where all the breweries so, and uh, homebrew shops and all that. What does it do for me? Well, it's gonna it's gonna very quickly uh, tell you where all the homebrew shops and uh, breweries and such and beer bars. Uh, are around you based off the uh, BA's database, which is uh, one of the most up-to-date databases. And then it's going to tell you which ones are going to give you discounts with your How AHA How much does it membership. cost for the, the, brew, the brew guru? It is free. Free, my it's friend. Free. I'm glad you asked. You know where you get Jeez. it. You get it from uh, the, the Google Play Store. You get it from the, the uh, Apple uh, App Store. And you don't have to pay for it, of course. And you can get it from, uh, like, the kid on the street. You can get it from, like, cruising the web, uh, the porn sites, everywhere. You can get it everywhere. That thing is every- it's like like an STD. It is everywhere. I heard the kids are using it these days, but <laughs> the, I just haven't tuned in. The kids are using it, yes. And, and you know, that's not the only benefit of an AHA membership. You got your Zymergy magazine. You got your eZymergy. You got your uh, your member forums. You got your member discounts. You've got uh, the Brew Guru app. You got the uh, the uh, the uh, the AHA rallies that we do. Uh, we do one at Heretic every year. We do them at a lot of great breweries across the country. I know at our AHA rally, it pays for the cost of your membership just going to that one thing. And when I used my my uh, AHA discount. I used to pay for it by going to like a restaurant, you know, one t- one time with the family. So uh, pays for your membership. There's so many free things in there, and to uh, top it off, right now uh, through uh, the Brewing Network address, if you now through Christmas Eve, if you go to thebrewingnetwork.com, click on the uh, Join the AHA link, and use the promo code BN Army, you're going to get two free books mailed to your home address. The books are going to be Wooden Beer: A Brewer's Guide. And Designing Great Beers, The Ultimate Guide to Brewing Classic Beer Styles by some guy named Ray Daniels. Never heard of him, but uh, you know, I guess it's a good book if uh, the BA published it. Um, That's right. All for joining uh, through the BN link. So check it out. Great organization. Great, great uh, membership deal. It pays for itself. It'll pay for itself when you get those two books. That right there is the cost of membership. If you don't have them, I know that's a smoker deal. Required. No STDs required. You can. I uh, just downloaded the Brew Guru. There you go. There you go. That's what I'm talking Done. about. Done. It was free, painless, and it runs quick. I was very pleased. Right on. All right. So back to uh, decoction. So tell us. All uh, right. Tell us more about uh, the results and uh, how many people hate you now. Right. Because nobody so, uh, loves you for crushing their decaution dreams. <laughs> uh, it's kind of funny. So with any experiment, the there's there's two sides, right? There's the there's the side of uh, I knew it didn't matter, and uh, you've proved it, so thank you. Or there's uh, I I knew it mattered, so thank you. You're awesome, mm-hmm. right? So it depends on depends on how it turns out, and it depends on which side you're on, and we are. Oft to say, you know, we, we 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 say a lot that this is one data set. You say this oft, mm-hmm. oft, yes, yes. So uh, I'm not sure why I say that, <laughs> but but essentially, this is one data set, one experiment, mm-hmm. one beer. Mm-hmm. So you know, I just described the beer I used. Mm-hmm. This does not mean that it would be the same results if we did a Bach, if mm-hmm. we did a Czech Pilsner, if I did a longer, more arduous decoction, mm-hmm. right? We love the fact that people question our processes because it helps us refine our processes. Mm -hmm. But for this individual test, I will stand by the data because Mm -hmm. I know how I brew and I know how I collect data. And tell us us, uh, 
and how you collected the data at the end and, and what that result was. Tell us your so, your testing methodology uh, of the beer. So what what we do, and this is before there was anyone else involved, uh, Marshall Shop from Brewlosophy would, you know, he created a Google Form survey, and he would do you know two beers side by side, mm-hmm. you know, so brewed the same day. Usually there's a little bit of a time uh, offset by like fifteen, twenty, thirty minutes, whatever, so that you're not going totally crazy, mm-hmm. and, and limitations due to chilling and et cetera. But we brew two beers side by side, so as accurate and as close as you can get within a garage, right? I mean, we are not uh, UC Davis or Siebel in, in a controlled laboratory, and we, and we accept that. We're mm-hmm. fine with that because we're home brewers. Mm-hmm. This is a experiment for home brewers by home brewers, mm-hmm. and I think that's important. I think that's important. So, what we do is we do two ex- two beers side by side and we control as much as we can for one variable mm-hmm. and then we take these beers blind to a panel and i usually advertise it on facebook and our, our whatever you know forum and i say hey i'm gonna be here come try a beer taste beer for science right mm-hmm. and we make it we have some fun with it and I text or I you know, I do have some Kindle fires and I, I pass those out and have people take a, a survey. Mm-hmm. And we've – over time, we've parsed down this survey to something very simple. It's, it explains you have two beers. You have three cups, you know, red, blue, green for, mm-hmm. for right now. Pick the unique beer. Mm-hmm. We don't ask you to do anything else. Just pick mm-hmm. which beer is right. different. So you get two Standard of one, triangle test. one of the other. Mm-hmm. Say again? Standard triangle test. Exactly, exactly. But th- that's new to some people. Some people don't understand. They're thinking like, "What should I be doing here?" And you just you just tell them. Mm-hmm. And even if even if I can't tell them directly, each uh, the directions of the Google survey says right. use all your sensory input, mm-hmm. aroma, smell, taste, you know, uh, uh, mouthfeel. Pick the unique beer. Mm-hmm. So. They input their name. They categorize themselves as a beer taster. Either I'm a brew fan, I'm not a brew fan, I'm a, I'm a brewer, I'm an enthusiast, mm-hmm. uh, I'm a judge, I'm a cicerone, etc. So they pick which beer they think is unique, and then it asks them to compare two beers, mm-hmm. and that changes depending on whether they got it right or not, mm-hmm. by the way. Because if you didn't select the unique beer, right. we don't actually consider your data for which one you prefer. The information is – is categorized, but it doesn't go into the uh, sub the sub uh, tree or, or, right. or offshoot. Mm-hmm. So, say you get it right, it'll say, "Okay, pick the blue and red cup." You pick the blue and red cup, and it says, "Which one do you prefer?" Mm-hmm. So we get a we get a which one's unique data set, and which one do you prefer data set? Mm-hmm. And depending on how many people we have, that de- that determines. Uh, the p value based on the strength of the, the sample size, mm-hmm. and we go for a p value of less than zero point zero five, so five uh, percent. Mm-hmm. And we're looking for is it a statistically significant result? So based on this on the sample size, do enough people beyond chance get the unique but uh, unique beer correct? Mm-hmm. In this particular experiment, for the first data set, so we have two data sets, which is unusual, but for the first data set, we had 33 people. Mm-hmm. And I'm very lucky in, in Pittsburgh, PA, to have a lot of support from the local breweries. So one particular brewery called Grist House, they always welcome me and, and allow me to set up my, my tasting panels there. If I don't get 30 to 40 people there, I'm amazed. It's mm-hmm. it's awesome. Mm-hmm. It's a centrally located place. People come. I had 33 people. And what's great about sampling there is I get professional brewers. I get home brewers. I get some people who just like to hang out at the brewery, you know, as customers, mm-hmm. patrons. Mm-hmm. So I get a good sw- uh, a spectrum of taste. Cross section. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because who are we brewing for? I mean – as a home brewer, you're brewing for yourself and your friends and family, really. But beer in general, we're brewing it for those who we, you know, socialize with, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, most home brewers know a few professional brewers, know a few people who like beer in general. So I think it's pretty representative of the beer drinking public. So what was their, your result? All right. So we had 33 people at the first data set. Mm-hmm. At that size for our test – we were required to have 17 people to 
to select the unique beer. Uh We had 15. Uh So purely by chance, if you have 33 people and you're given three choices, 11 people would have been one third, right? Right. So so some people like to extrapolate that and say, oh, it was so close. It's only Uh two away. (laughs) So that's not how stats work, right? You know, right. So uh, for this particular beer, at this particular uh, process, you know, in in my methods, it, it appears that participants were not able to reliably distinguish a German pills mm-hmm. made with a triple decoction with a modified uh, Hock Kurs method mm-hmm. from a single infusion batch. They just weren't able to do it. Well, and you know. <laughs> It's difficult just to brew the same beer twice, uh, homebrew wise. A lot of yes. a lot of homebrewers can't even do that. Yet they worry right. about decoction as being this great gift to making their beer spectacular. And if they tried to brew two single infusion batches side by side or two decoction batches side by side, chances are they'd be so different that. <laughs> People would go, oh, yeah, this is a different one. And you'd yeah. get you know, 33 out of 33 going, well, this is the different one, if they just tried to make the same beer twice. So the fact that you were able to you know, uh, you know, make them fairly close together is uh, uh, pretty surprising. Well, just think about what happens. I mean, you know, you know but uh, the, gen- the general listener, think about what happens if you're doing a decoction mm-hmm. and you're doing a single infusion next to each other. Mm-hmm. For those beers to come out the same – I don't think it's as much of a testament as it is to the brewer, and in this case myself, as it is to the brewing process. It's a very robust and very forgiving process. Mm-hmm. There's a few things that will push it to the extremes. You know, sanitation. You know, right. very poor, very very poor temperature control. Very oh, poor yeast health. Yeah. But but by and large, it's a, ro- a robust mm-hmm. process. And if you drive within the lines, mm-hmm. I think you're going to make a decent beer. Yeah. You know, the I, mash is is just not that important. You know, people I, I'm not. Like, I'm not willing to say that. But <laughs> people I freak out about that. Oh, it was supposed to be 152. I get this all the time. Your book said 152. It was 151. The beer is ruined. <laughs> I'm like, it doesn't make any difference. Well, oh, I, I know I know. can take my my thermo pen from ThermoWorks, which I love. Right? I can take my thermo pen and stick it yeah. in the mash, and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm at 151.5. And then I can look around at my friend who's like, you know, this super like crazy guy and I'll stir it. I go, oh, shit, we're at one, five, three. And I'll just kind of laugh. It really doesn't matter. I mean, you know, if you're in the general vicinity, you're good. All right. And what about the second group you had? Mm. So one of the other questions we get a lot is, well, of course, people can't identify this mysterious you know, delta in the woods. You, know, you have this one little difference, and they're basically <laughs> taking this beer, and they can't tell. So, what if you clued them in on the difference? And uh-huh. I'll, I'll tell you what, I, I'm, I'm still partially. I have my my foot in both pools. You know, <laughs> I'm still like, I'm oh, still please. thinking like, well, I think, I think that could matter. I think that could matter. Oh, let's tell, all right. let's uh-huh. tell them the difference. Let's tell them the difference. Let's okay. tell them yeah. that this is a decoction uh-huh. beer, okay. and then they'll definitely get it. You know, because once they know, they'll know what to look for, right? right. Any brewer worth his, uh, sure. worth his uh, mash salts and minerals, and you, and you got worse say, results. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> at this point, they're going to go. I know what to look for. Mm-hmm. It's going to be malty. It's going to be sweeter. Uh-huh. It's probably going to be drier. It's going to be clearer. It's going to have better head retention. Right. Okay. In the second set. So we talked about this, whether or not we wanted to do it. And we were going to do an entire data set of sightedness, mm-hmm. have multiple experiments mm-hmm. with sightedness for the, uh, the, quote, semi-blind triangle. Well, because of this topic and because it's so uh, hotly debated and popular, we thought we're going to release both data sets for this one. You know, So I, once again, I'm lucky we have a very uh, vibrant – homebrewing culture here in pittsburgh pa and for our holiday party i said hey i need some volunteers to do another triangle mm-hmm. and i got 22 people mm-hmm. and at a homebrewing a homebrewing party wouldn't you think you had a slightly different uh <laughs> tasting group than mm-hmm. than the random at a, at a brewery sure. uh-huh. you know with a taste with the tasting room right i had multiple certified mm-hmm. judges sure. i had multiple national judges Mm -hmm. 22 people Mm -hmm. in order to reach uh, statistical significance i would have needed 12 taster 
12 tasters for P less than 0.05, mm-hmm. and I only had eight. That's mm-hmm. actually worse mm-hmm. <laughs> than the other than the other data set. Yeah, once you tell yeah. people something like that, it, it screws it up. All of a sudden, they start imagining things, yes. and their imagination tells them they're better off picking out the the different beer if you don't tell them what to look for. If you're essentially telling I, them what to look for, you screw them up because then they imagine – they are imagining just, what yeah. what you know that they're finding that, and that's what messes them up. And there, it could actually blind them to picking out the actual difference. I think there's so. two things that happen there, and I think that one of them, what you said, is is absolutely true. And the other one is uh, you find what you're seeking. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so I think both of those are at play. So at, at one aspect. I prefer to be free of uh, bias, so I don't want when, – when someone at a homebrew club meeting comes up to me and goes, hey, would you try this beer? Right. And they, they start to talk. I go, uh, 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 shh, 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 you know, a preemptive shh. Here's a shh, shh, shh Oh, you know? no, I have them tell <laughs> me because I want to know, you know, how to make them happy so they don't get no, all pissed off at me. No, See, I'm, I'm notoriously <laughs> mean, so I will tell them. I will tell them, don't tell me anything about this beer. I don't care that you brewed it on your wife's birthday, uh-huh. you know. I don't care that it's a pilsner. Just let me taste it and let me let me perceive well, what I perceive. Here, I've I've got a pilsner story. A German, North German pils. I I brewed one year. Entered in the Washoe Zephyr Zymer just uh, competition up in Reno. It was a great competition with lots of great judges and uh, Dave Sapsis, who was uh, uh, really I think one of the the best uh, palates out there, was there judging. He judged the. Uh, uh, Northern German or the Pilsner category, the lager category, and I think uh, my beer got uh, uh, first place, went on to best of show or something, or I can't remember the exact details. Of course, details it there. did, and and uh, <clears throat> it didn't win, or it didn't win first place, or one of the others. Uh, maybe it got second place, didn't go on to best of show, and on the drive back. I was like, all right, so, you know, what was it on my beer that, you know, you didn't like? He goes, ah, it wasn't quite dry enough. I was like, excellent beer. I really liked it. I was pushing it for for it, but it wasn't quite dry enough. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. So I brewed the beer again for the, the next year's competition. Same thing. He was up there judging that category. My beer was in there. I'm like, it's drier this year. I lowered my mash temperature. That thing's drier. I tasted it myself. It's drier. Put it in. And it, like, didn't place or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. right back, I'm like, you son of a bitch. I'll tell you, I entered that same beer. It was drier this time. You said it wasn't dry enough last time. Now, and he's like, oh, you know. He goes, uh, I didn't know that was your beer, of course. He's like, uh, but I remember that beer. It seemed quite sweet. And I'm like, ah, it's drier than last time. You don't know. You get your head up your ass. And so I go home. I just so happen to have a bottle from the previous year and a bottle from that year. I taste them side by side. And lo and behold, the one from the previous year was drier. My Because I had convinced myself that with a lower mash temperature, I had gotten a drier beer. That uh-huh. was that was I had convinced myself, and I did you know it, until I kissed him side by side. Did it measure dryer? No, they they both measured the same finishing gravity. Okay, yeah. Because dryness so, isn't necessarily a measure of finishing gravity. It's you know it's no, a lot of other no. things. And uh, so, damn, he was totally right. A year apart, he he was able to pick out which one was drier. <laughs> And, I and that may them. have been that may have been like actual like he may have actually been able to tell you know perceptible dryness. But I like to tell people there's two things there's there's measurable, and then there's perceivable. Mm-hmm. So you can take all these instruments, but mind you, we don't go into a brewery or a bar and taste with instruments. Well, sure. not not most of us. And uh, well, perceivable is the most important thing in, in brewing. Yes, exactly, exactly. So perceivable dryness is more important than measurable dryness. You can have a beer that that finishes lower in gravity mm-hmm. and tastes sweeter. It, mm-hmm. You know, who hasn't had a Belgian triple that was one point zero zero four but tasted like honey? Right, right. right. You know? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Uh, How would you describe these two beers or this this beer? I mean, in terms of its flavor, um, and uh, I know you you talk about these things in the Brulosophy article, but um, w- could you perceive any differences in color, 
uh, after fermentation, clarity, you know, any characteristics at all? Okay, so you know, mind you, uh, you know, I'd like to give the caveat and the disclaimer of I'm very close to the beers. These are my babies. I was with them through the entire has, process. Has somebody given so, you a blind triangle on it? Well, so you can only be semi-blind because I know what the variable is, right? Yeah. Um, so I've done it. Um, I almost I almost stepped into a, a Navy joke in there and said I did it both ways. But <laughs> um, I've done it multiple uh, versions of a, of a semi-blind. So what I've done is I've had someone mix them up for me. Mm-hmm. And I've also – what I often do is I take three – cups of the same color mm-hmm. and i'll mark one you know with um some indicator like i for infusion or d for decoction mm-hmm. i'll pour them and then i'll mix them two or three times and i even sent this to the to the brewlosophy crew because you know mm-hmm. we like to give each other a lot of shit so i basically said hey, okay i'm gonna do this via video mm-hmm. and i mixed them up and you can kind of tell that i was doing it Blind because I was close my eyes, mm-hmm. and you can you, you can just tell by the way someone's feeling around the cups, and I'm, right. I'm mixing them up. And I, I was I was five for five uh, on a uh, yeah. self-induced semi-blind triangle. You put now, them on a lazy susan and spin it. Yeah, that's, that's a better way. <laughs> yeah. Well, this way is more awkward and more fun for the viewer. Uh-huh. But, uh-huh. but uh, yeah, so I, I mix them up and I would taste them, and but I can't say. So the first two times I did it, mm-hmm. I almost. Like I looked at the bottom of the cup and I was like, "Holy shit, I'm right," mm-hmm. you know. So, the reason why I picked a beer I cannot say was because I picked this beer being different because it was maltier and sweeter. It's smoother. A lot of the classic reasons for why you say mm-hmm. it was just it, different. It, it was just different, you right. know. So you know you were just saying, "Oh my god," you know, you made two beers side mm-hmm. by side with completely different processes mm-hmm. and. Statistically, they weren't different. You know, right. good for you. Good for you. Now, and, you know, it made me smile. I'm thinking like, yeah, Jay-Z just said I just did something cool. But at the same time, right. I know how hard that is to do. It's very hard to do. You know, you know they, they – here's an interesting thing is, you know, they say you can't taste um, less than a 5 IBU difference. I think yeah. you can taste like a 1 IBU difference. I really do. <laughs> I've I've well, had beers presented and I'm just like, well, this one's more bitter. Yeah, one IBU difference. I'm like, I don't know what to tell you, but I think, yeah, you know, if you're really side by side and you know pick the one that's more bitter, you can do that. So I, I think I was able to pick those beers out because there was something different. Yeah, and to me, it was like this perceived bitterness so i'm not sure if that was tannins and that that may or may not be from decoction i don't mm-hmm. know you know i i'm not was qualified that perceived to say that bitterness in the ta- in the in the decoction beer say again was the perceived this tannic bitterness perhaps in the the decoction beer actually yes i i personally perceived the infusion beer as smoother and softer hmm. yeah. now that could be complete bs it, you know, because that's just the way it works. Right. You know, right. people's uh, opinions of themselves and their abilities to taste is is just to me it's unreliable. It's yep. it's a subjective opinion, yep. and it's a lot of fun and it's, it's entertaining to talk about. Mm-hmm. But I could just I could just quote tell the difference. <laughs> well, <laughs> the other thing about all this is. I don't think the no, we could do these experiments endlessly, and the the collection of them that I've been part of, or tasted of, or you know uh, heard of, they all say essentially decoction is not making a difference, and the people who are like, no, no, it is. I mean, they they'll do kind of an experiment, <laughs> and they're like, oh, it absolutely, it proved it, you know. We had 20 right. say it was uh, – they, they couldn't identify the, the beer and 21 that could. So there you go. It wins yeah. by one. And um, I think the only way to really settle this is to do the, the beers and do some sort of uh, uh, quantitative analysis of uh, you know HBLC very, or very, you know, various compounds in the beers. And show what really is different about the two beers, and if it's whoa, of, whoa, whoa, whoa. So, a detectable let me amount. Interrupt. Yeah? See, like maybe, uh-huh. but 
we could do like multiple, you know, analysis and labs. Right, right. You know, and we can prove that they, yeah, that like, they're technically for, different. For analysis, I'm, they're I'm technically telling, different. But. Right, but I'm telling you, even then, that difference is going to be so minor because if you if you look at, uh, all right, here's one about um, uh, Dan Gordon. All right, Dan Gordon at uh, Gordon Beers. Uh, hello, Never guys. Thank you very. Very much for your informative shows of the years. This is from Tim and Tim Polster. Uh, I've learned a lot from your advice. Uh, upon listening to Sunday shows, latest broadcast of Dan Gordon. I was thinking about his brewery's decoction method and would like to ask about it, uh, taking it a bit further. Dan said they do all the rest before decoction, so he's putting the first decoction in the high 160 degree Fahrenheit range and adding back to eventual mash out of 176. I was thinking if he does the boiling after all the rest, why not just boil the entire mash and drain in the boil cutter? Sounds like a lot of the mash get get boiled to double the cutter. Anyways, see any negatives to this? Anyways, um, you know if you're uh, you know d- doing your decoction after all your rests and all that, I imagine anything you're getting out of boiling it probably just coagulates and you know you're not getting a conversion after that point. Because pretty much all your enzymes are done in your – well, now you still have some enzymes at 160. Um, but you're pretty much not getting anything out of it at that point. And it just gets boiled and dumped with the rest of the, the troop. So uh, I, I can't imagine that there's – even in a uh, quantitative analysis with uh, you know measuring these various compounds, I bet you it's pretty, pretty close. So one of the things I really want to do is I want to do a decoction, mm-hmm. and then I want to do a post sparge collection. Uh-huh. And instead of diluting the decoction beer up to the infusion beer's mm-hmm. volume, I want to boil the single infusion beer down to the to decoction. Ah, uh, interesting. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. 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 I think you know and you get word you get, only uh, no grain. If you're if you're looking for that malty and smooth, uh, you'll get that by that's my rapping name by know, the way. Malty, malty and smooth, smooth is my by, rapper name. <laughs> you'll get that by not uh, not sparging at all. Just you know, uh, no sparge. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's that's a uh, method used by a lot of people who want to do you know very high gravity brewing you know you just mm-hmm. do no sparks right it's well even, low if you efficiency. Want to, even if you want to do low low gravity brewing you do uh, no sparks and you don't use a lot of water in the in the mash and then you know you just thin it out with water later on sure uh you know you get a a, a nicer maltier flavor i think you, you know if if people were so keen on decoction to give them multi flavor they would uh just uh, skip the sparging so what do you think about this? Uh, you know, either Jamil or, or John, why would a very successful and very traditional brewery do decoction if it made no difference? Ah, well, let's, ah, let's, ah. let's address that question after the break. But speaking of because you reminded me of very successful uh, like Nico Brew. Our friend Nico, uh, he has the hops you're looking for. Yeah, I'm wearing a Nico Brew shirt right now. <laughs> uh, did he have you take a picture of yourself and send it into him so you got the right size? No, John can verify. Apparently, it, John, he does. <laughs> yeah, yep. Nico, yes. well, Nico is awesome. All right. Well, because he, he that's what he does. He's got great Nico Brew shirts and shorts and uh, hoodies and hats and thongs. And if you send a picture of yourself into him naked. Uh, he will make sure you get the right size of what you're ordering. So send your naked pictures into uh, uh, Nico Brew to make sure that when you order your your uh, your size. Um, and I guess we we determined last time we're not supposed to do that for toddlers. No, yeah, it's adults only. <laughs> it's adult, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, adults only. Uh, <clears throat> you send that in there. But Nico Brew has the hops you're looking for from your standard recipes to your hard-to-find uh, hops, your your latest uh, and greatest uh, hops that uh, are out there, all the uh, fancy ones, the, 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 the regular ones. You can get them all for $5 shipping. He's been doing that for seven years, and he still does it. It's a great deal, super fast turnaround, and uh, 
these hops you're getting, they're nitrogen flushed and mylar bags. They're treated right. They're kept cold. Uh, you know, perfect for your for your brewing day. So uh, check them out at uh, nicobrew.com. Again, send them a naked photo of yourself. So uh, when you when you order a shirt, uh, you get it at the right size. I know Nico is very. Uh, you know, very conscious of that. Make sure, you know, you guys that, you know, it encompasses enough of yourself. So, because he needs to know the length of the T-shirt uh, so it's hanging down enough. So, you want to get like a full body shot, you know, at least knees up, right? Right, Bebo? <laughs> <laughs> He's got a naked, naked photo of me on file. Oh, yeah. That's how you got that shirt that fit perfectly, didn't it? Yes, it's it's beautiful. There you go. All right. So we well, just uh, got mine from the carbonite impression. <laughs> <laughs> right. well, let's take a short break. When we come back, uh, we'll hear more of the question about uh, uh, why do uh, some breweries do decoction right after this. Brewing great beer is a process of continuous learning, and the best books on every aspect of brewing can be found at Brewers Publications. With more than 50 awesome titles like Modern Homebrew Recipes by Gordon Strong, Designing Great Beers, The Ultimate Guide to Brewing Classic Beer Styles by Ray Daniels, American Sour Beers, Innovative Techniques for Mixed Fermentations by Michael Tonsmeyer, For the Love of Hops, The Practical Guide to Aroma, Bitterness, and the Culture of Hops by Stan Hieronymus and Radical Brewing Recipes, Tales, and World Altering Meditations in a Glass by Randy Mosher, plus many, many more. These are the books and the authors with the knowledge to push your brewing farther than you thought possible. And you'll find them all at fine homebrew and book retailers everywhere. And visit the website at BrewersPublications.com. Brewers Publications, all the best on beer and brewing. Your support of the Brewing Network means everything to us. We couldn't produce shows without you. And we love giving you something extra for that support, like Brew Your Own Magazine. You already know it's a great brewing magazine full of recipes, equipment how-tos, discussions of beer styles, and brewing techniques. Whether you're new to brewing and just starting out or you're an old pro, you'll always learn something from the articles in Brew Your Own. Plus, there are amazing special issues like plans for building a Brutus 10 system, 250 classic clone recipes, and the Home Brewer's Answer Book. Brew Your Own Magazine and BYO.com are awesome resources for any brewer. Whether for yourself or as a gift, when you subscribe or resubscribe from the Brewing Network homepage, you directly support programs like this. Get a great magazine and support the Brewing Network. Subscribe to Brew Your Own right from the BrewingNetwork.com. Learning to brew has never been so disgusting. This is Brew Strong. back stay tuned if you're listening live because we're going to be giving away that catalyst fermenter uh in in a little bit here so if you're listening live you've got an opportunity to get one of them bad boys so stay stay tuned all right uh stay tuned also to our good sponsor adam and eve malcolm you big adam and eve uh shopper you shop on there? Uh, absolutely. It's on my uh, my Amazon wish list for uh, things I want my wife to buy me. There you go. Just direct her over to Adam and Eve, adamandeve.com. Have her use the offer code Jamel, J-A-M-I-L, at checkout. She's gonna, I'll tell you what. She's going to get 50% <laughs> off of just about any one item. She's going to get three free full-length adult DVDs. She's going to get the free Power O vibrating ring. Which I'm sure you could use, and mm-hmm. top it all off, free shipping on the whole thing, just for using the offer code Jamel J A M I L at AdamandEve dot com. Huh? Hey, listen, if you have a boring family Christmas dinner, yeah, put Adam and put Adam and Eve on your Secret Santa wish list for the family grab bag. <laughs> oh man, there you go. Yeah, just whip out one of them Power O vibrating O rings. Turn it on and slap it on the table during. Put on the turkey. Put yeah. on the turkey leg. Make yeah. that that leg 
vibrate. Yeah. Huh? Well, yeah. When your when your mother in law calls and said, "What is this rabbit that that your wife wants? What is that?" Hey. Oh, Malcolm, I love you, man. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> All right. Um, the uh, the the question was um, why do some why? breweries do this uh, process? Why do they insist on decoction? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, you're asking me. Um, oh, the the yeah. reason is yeah because they believe it makes a difference. That's your just, opinion, right? Just, well, just like a home brewer does. Why do home brewers do it? Because it's cool, makes well, a difference. I mean, maybe it's a marketing thing. Uh, you know, we did this Doppelbach uh, just recently, and uh, I, I was there at uh, at uh, GABF, and we had it on. People were drinking it, and they're like, "Oh man, how many times did you decoct this?" <laughs> like single infusion. <laughs> they're like, "What?" Like, you know, oh, this is decocted, man. It's like, no, I was there. Single infusion. So, yeah. I, what I should have said is like, oh man, this is this is a quadruple Five. decoction. Yeah, <laughs> we decoct okay. the hell. We start like on Tuesday and we finish Saturday. That's how decocted this thing is. So let me be the devil's advocate, and this okay. is somewhat, you know, m- maybe funny from the guy who just performed an experiment in which the results were. Mm-hmm insignificant from a homebrew perspective okay why would someone who is very successful and makes great beer like pilsner or quell why would they Uh do a decoction in multiple step decoction Uh if if you assumed it did not matter why would they do that well if if i decided it didn't matter well (laughs) they don't give a shit what i think (laughs) but if by you you mean them uh, because that's the way they've always done it. For I think there's, there may be history. some truth to that. There may be, mm-hmm. but if it's so energy intensive uh-huh. and it's so time intensive, to me, this is you know obviously being devil's advocate mm-hmm. because I'm I'm like I, I like the tradition, I like the science, mm-hmm. but I'm also a pragmatist, so I'm like I'm confused. Why would they do that? Why would? They? Oh, because you. So you're. You're giving commercial brewers far too much credit here for for being able to think and to uh, be analytical and to make the best decisions for their business. Um, I guarantee you that every brewery, every brewery out there has things that they do that just don't make any sense. And like beechwood aging, right? It's it's well, there's a reason for that, believe it or not. Um, surface area? Yeah, get more yeast surface area. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, you know, I'll guarantee you at our brewery at Heretic, there is, there's things we do just because, well, that's the way we've been doing them and everything's been fine. So let's not change anything. And so as we, we go through, unless there's a problem where, you know, we don't tend to change those things. It, it, we have to get to a point where we've got no problems that we're dealing with. And then all of a sudden we're like, you know, what about this thing? And then we look at it, and then maybe we change it or not. But there's so many things there that could possibly, you know, that we do just because that, well, that's the way we've been doing and We don't really have control over it. We don't really have knowledge over it. We don't really have, uh, you know, we haven't really decided this is the best way to do it. It's just, well, it's working right now, so let's not screw with it. And a brewery well, will do I- that for, you know, 800 years. Yeah, I th- I, but I think, though, the That's other like pressure that a lot something. of com- commercial brewers face <laughs> is that their customers expect it. Sure. You know, they've, um, they've advertised the way it's been that they've been done. doing this sure. process. Uh-huh. You know, I yeah. mean, if, if Budweiser to, were to announce in their ongoing cost-cutting measures that they're going to get rid of Beachwood aging, right. you know, there would be an uproar. Right. If they're like, hey, you know, we realize it doesn't make any difference at all and then <laughs> pull it out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Miller doesn't do it. We don't need to do it either. Right. Wait, I can taste yeah. the beech wood, though. <laughs> <laughs> right. Side by side triangle test. And that's, I think that's what, you know, modern German brewers are facing. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, they, 
they they've done decoction. They have a history of doing decoction. You know, the German people believe that decoction is and German brewing tradition is important uh, as part of their identity. By God, we're going to keep mm-hmm. doing it. Well, and by so God, can, you know, look at religion. People have their you know preferences on religion, and yeah. no amount of you know pointing out that a lot of it is improbable will convince people otherwise. You know, they base it so, off of a belief. I think people just don't like passion. change. True. Yeah. Or like change and don't like sure. change. Yeah. Certain changes. The ones that they want. Mm-hmm. They like, like that, but anything else. Like sex reassignment or... Sure. <laughs> I, I can tell you some of our most spirited responses have been from people with very obviously uh, Central European names. So... <laughs> Like, oh they, man, they, that you just went racist, man. Oh uh, sure, but no, you know I understand <laughs> that. I no, I understand it though. So essentially, someone's challenging your uh-huh. one of your core beliefs, mm-hmm. and they'll sit there and and they will they will prattle on about you didn't do it right. You need to do it this way. You need to do it with this mall. You need you need to do it with this beer. And I understand it. You know, mm-hmm. I, I don't. Dis- first of all, I don't discount it. Okay. Because I because wa- I wonder I wonder if I had done a longer decoction, if I had done a different beer, mm-hmm. would it have mattered? Because that's what no. a person, even if it's a freaking garage scientist, mm-hmm. that's what you do. You know, you, you don't assume you're right. You question. Your, well, you know, until someone else can reflect. can duplicate your uh, your experiment and get the same results, right? Um, sure. Which I think has been done over and over again. But let's hear from Frank, insert, you know, European name here. Um, <laughs> uh, Frank says, one subject that was not discussed in the two recent MASH programs is decoction. I'm sure we discussed decoction. We must have. Well, we did a whole decoction show. Uh, specifically, decoction's effect upon extract efficiency and fermentability. I brew German styles almost exclusively, and I often do decoction. Single or double or no decoction for a mash schedule of 143 dough in, step to 152, and finally a mash out step for a total period of about 60 to 75 minutes and perhaps 90 with the decoctions. Purely conjecture without scientific evaluation, but my experience has been that the decoctions have much better dis- extraction, often as much as 5 to 10% more. And these beers seem to have better attenuation, sometimes as much as one Plato. These results appear to be consistent, though vary by degree between recipes such as Hellas and Doppelbach. While I am as accurate as my tools when measuring uh, quantities of grain, water, and temps, I am not as accurate with pitching rates. I'm probably in the ballpark, but do not have the tools for accurate measurement. Do you have any theories for these results? It is perhaps due to the extra time that it takes to do the decoctions compared to non-decoction steps, uh, allowing more time for the main mash to gelatinize and to convert, perhaps related to temperatures of the decoction, where the mass of the decoction should not only be completely gelatinized, but also heat will break down starches. Um, yeah, I think um, Frank's got it right. It's really based off of all those things where... <laughs> I've always said if you if you let your uh, your mash sit, you will extract more. Uh, you know, yes. you'll, you'll get ninety nine percent of everything out pretty quick. But the longer it sits there, the longer the more you uh, extract, you will you will realize from from that batch. That's so, true. It doesn't really have anything to do with the caction. Not not today. It has to do with crush. So and. The reason some people will see a, a bigger difference in that and a, and a smaller difference in that is based on the crush. So the more you crush your mold, the the, the quicker that is going to reach a terminal value. Uh, the less you crush it, the, the longer that that effect takes place because of the the starch is kind of locked up inside the grain, the bigger chunks of grain. So that's one of those things. So a longer mash effect, a longer mash favors uh, or improves. Uh, a coarser crush. Mm-hmm. That's what we're saying. There you go. Yeah. I'll, I'll put that. John. Um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, we will continue to talk a bit longer, but even though we've gone long, Malcolm, it's all your fault. We're at like an hour yep. and a half uh, in a one-hour show. Bevo. Hi. Stand by the phones. 
Can I sit by them? You can sit by the phones. Uh, you lay down by the phones if you want. Even better. All, all you phone, folks listening, so you're going to take the first caller, 888-401-BEER, uh, 2337. And uh, the first person to call in that she answers, you're going to win yourself the Catalyst uh, Conical Fermenter. So uh, there you Damn. go. Dial away. There it is. Hey, John, put your phone down. Put your phone down. I know. I was, I was ready. I had mine out, too. Yeah. There you go. Uh, so we are giving away a Catalyst Conical Fermenter tonight. All right. So any last thoughts, Malcolm, on uh, this experiment, whether uh, it should be repeated again or you're confident in the results or you're still clinging to that dream that decoction makes a difference? I will tell you two things. One, <laughs> okay. I am I confident in one. results. Yes. Uh-huh. I'm confident in results because I know how I brew uh-huh. and I know I know who I collect from and I know the method I collect Mm-hmm. So I'm confident for this particular beer mm-hmm. and for this particular experiment, the results are accurate. Okay. But I'm not willing to say that decoction does not matter. I'm not because okay. it does not matter for this particular beer, for this <laughs> okay. particular brewer, me. So you keep repeating it until you get the result you want? Is that is that uh, what a good no, scientist does? No, that's a, that's a fair <laughs> challenge actually, Jason. Right. That, that is. That uh-huh. is. What I'm what I'm saying is that I cannot claim that it will not matter for all other results because I hadn't done them yet. Okay. So have you stopped? Now you will stop doing decoctions on on German pilsners. Is this, is this an accurate statement? <laughs> um, you will no longer do for, them for German pilsners. Yes. Probably. Okay. But, uh, what do you mean for probably? Czech, for a Czech pilsner, for a Hefeweizen, okay. for a Bach. So, so you're going to no, repeat not, it, this experiment for all those different styles, <laughs> right? Is this um, correct? You, you need to email my wife. No, and, no, no, uh, no. <laughs> Decide right now. You're going to do all uh, these different ones, and then when all of them show the same result, you're going to say what? How many do you need to brew? How many styles do you need to brew? How many more times do you need to do this before you're convinced? Wow. Give me I a number. do not have an answer for that. Give me a number. Come on. <laughs> it's probably a sideways eight. Sideways. I, I think he's gonna ha- he's gonna have to do about seven times for me. Okay. Yeah, yeah seven. I will go with John Palmer on this one. Seven. Well, I'll tell you, see okay, the so thing is it seven more times to Malcolm, I'll I've, believe you. I've done this myself. <laughs> I've heard I've participated in other people's experiments, and I'm telling you, they all come out the same. Hey, if they're, so if who, they're controlled who well. For J- uh, Jamil. Yes. Uh, uh, Jamel, sorry. Uh, who brewed for Denny Kahn's experiment? Oh, that was so long ago. Uh, maybe Denny or something. I don't know. Denny was oh. absolutely convinced. Yeah. So, so didn't matter so what. I'm not willing to discount Denny. Yeah. I'm not willing to discount I am. other Discounted. prominent – no, home brewers and, and, and professional brewers. However, mm-hmm. uh, I think that the result that we had is accurate for for my process and for my beer. Mm-hmm. And I I can't wait to hear other people's results. Right. And and, I, and we will continue to explore explore the topic. Absolutely. Okay. Do we have a winner? We have a winner. <gasps> the winner is Jeff Angel. Jeff Angel. Is he, 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 I love the magic that guy does. You know, it, it seems like he's really, you know, <laughs> swallowing those needles and, you know, it's really passing out his belly button. Of hand. And it's just amazing. Crazy. And the guy is magic. The guy is absolutely magic. <laughs> I'm judging you. <laughs> you judge me and you find me wanting? Is that what you're saying? Uh, she wants me. That's what I heard. Yes. All right. Well, thank you, Malcolm. Uh, excellent, excellent uh, information and uh, great job on uh, on showing that decoction really doesn't do damn diddly squat. <laughs> That's what yeah. I get out of this show. I think the end game and the end result is that decoction doesn't matter. <laughs> Suck it. Yeah, that's right. Suck it. <laughs> All right. Hey, th- thanks, Jamil. Hey, thanks, thanks for joining us. We'll we'll have you, you on again. I hope. Uh, 
not too distant future. All right. Uh, yeah. Thanks, everyone. A great show. If you're listening live, stay tuned. We're going to have a live Q&A show coming up right after this. If you enjoy this kind of programming, I would highly suggest checking out our sponsors, especially that uh, BlickmanEngineering.com. They're giving away all that great stuff. You, all you got to go do is go over there and click, 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 and type, 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 and you're done. And you could, you could be winning all that stuff. Uh, check it out on BlickmanEngineering.com. And um, the other thing you do to support us is uh, go to the Bring Network store. And uh, check out all the goodies in there. You can buy yourself some hats and hoodies and glassware. And uh, they got clocks. They've got uh, ceiling fans. they got it all. And uh, you get any one of those things, and uh, you're entered in for a free uh, Maserati. Uh, that's what they're giving away this, this, this week. So get to the store right away and uh, get yourself a chance to win the Maserati. All right. Till then, everybody, Bruce Strong. Bruce Strong, everyone. 